Hi, Yusuf. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast at a podcast app near you. You are Yusuf Munayer, the uh, executive director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Is that right? That is right. And that is itself a coalition of NGOs or what? Yeah, it's a, it's a coalition of uh, over 330 different organizations throughout the uh, United States, uh, big and small organizations uh, across the country working to advocate for Palestinian rights in the United States. Okay. So we're going to talk about the events that unfolded uh, a few days ago at, at the uh, border between, uh, along the border between Gaza and Israel. Uh, started off as a protest uh, that had been long in the making uh, from the Gaza side. Uh, a number of protesters were shot by Israeli soldiers. The last number I saw of deaths was that 17 had died. Um, in, in at least some cases, there is video seeming to indicate that they posed no threat to the Israeli soldiers when they were shot. We can talk about that in in more detail. Um but first, why don't we provide uh, people with some background? Uh, and and maybe we should, before we talk about the march and its purpose, maybe we should provide kind of uh, deep historical background. Um, of course, uh, Israel was, I guess, created by the UN in, was, that was in 1948, Yes, yeah, so you have a, the UN partition plan resolution in 1947, uh, but ultimately Israel was created uh, out of a, a, a war that took place in 1948, uh, where at the time Zionist militias were able to conquer the majority of the, the territory, what is today Israel, after the war, uh, which during which there were uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees created that allowed what was a Jewish minority in Palestine to become a Jewish majority in what would become Israel. Uh, after that war, of course, the international recognition of Israel followed from different states and ultimately they also became a member state of the uh, United Nations uh, as well. Um, so uh, that's, you know, 19, 1947 through 1949. Uh, and, of course, uh, what we saw in the last several days um, has its origins in those uh, early moments. And the Gaza Strip, of course, which is today home to about 2 million people, the majority of its inhabitants are not originally from Gaza, but are refugees from towns and villages uh, surrounding the Gaza Strip uh, that sought refuge uh, in Gaza and became refugees in camps there uh, after the war in, uh, in 1948. Sure. Uh, and so uh, one of the goals of this march, uh, and, and we can talk more about uh, that later on, but one of the goals of this march was to assert the right of Palestinian refugees in Gaza to be able to go home to the lands and the towns and the villages from which they are uh, originally from and from which they were forced to flee during the war and were never able to return to because of the creation of the state of Israel. And that would include descendants of inhabitants of those homes. I mean, I assume by now most of the people in Gaza didn't actually live in the homes, but they are either either they did live in those homes or they are direct descendants of their Correct. offspring or grand offspring or whatever. Cool. Um, and of course, this is the, uh, you know, the phrase right of return you hear every once in a while. It's traditionally been thought of as kind of a sticking point in negotiations because uh, I guess Israelis would say, well, you know, these these homes are occupied now. If you let all the people back who have a who say they have a claim to these homes, that would completely alter the demographics. I, I don't know what the numbers would be, but. Anyway, it's considered it's considered a non-starter pretty much from the Israeli side. And sometimes you hear, you know, proposals where 
everyone would nominally have the right of return, but there would be ways to compensate some if they chose to accept compensation in lieu of actual return. But in any event, it's been so long since peace talks got anywhere near any kind of resolution that it's almost uh, pointless to talk about possible ways of actually working this issue out through negotiation. But in any event, this thing was called, and maybe one more thing we should say for the sake of people who really don't pay much attention to this, is there's two populations of uh, Palestinians on uh, Israel's border. Uh, There's the West Bank, which is to the east of Israel, is administered, well, to varying degrees directly by Israel. Sometimes the administration is kind of outsourced in some some regions and in some cases less so. But in any event, Gaza is a little different because Israel just chose to withdraw, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, without really negotiating the status of what, what, what would happen afterwards. But, but they withdrew. So there's no troops in, uh, Israeli troops in Gaza, but, uh, there is a kind of a, they control, Israel in effect controls the borders. There's an Egyptian border, but, uh, the current, uh, Egyptian administration is more or less playing along with what Israel wants to do, right? Is that, is that a fair, yeah, Sorry. so there, there's a difference in circumstances between what's going on in the Gaza Strip and what's going on in the West Bank. Uh, but as far as international law is concerned, it's a distinction without uh, a difference. Uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why you, know, you use the term border, and I myself have used that sometimes. It's, it's very problematic because it kind of suggests that there's some sort of international recognized boundary uh, there, but but that's not the case. The only demarcation between Israel and the Gaza Strip was an armistice line after the war in 1949. Uh, Israel, of course, occupied the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip in 1967, uh, and became the uh, belligerent occupant of those territories from that point forward. Uh, and um, continued belligerent be- in a legal sense of the term. I take it you mean. Right. This is yeah. this is determined under international law, and of course there are you know rules and regulations that uh, apply to the occupier uh, as far as international humanitarian law is concerned uh, that charges them with the well-being of the civilian population in occupied territory. And just because you don't necessarily have troops on the ground within a particular space doesn't mean you don't still occupy it because you exercise what the international legal standard is of effective control. Uh, And so by controlling what gets in and out of Gaza um, and essentially entering Gaza at will, uh, both uh, its its airspace, land and sea space, any time that they want, the Israelis uh, exercise effective control over the Gaza Strip uh, and still uh, occupy it and under international law are responsible for the well-being of the civilian population there. Um, so it's important to keep in mind, you know, we, in a lot of the reporting that we've seen over the last several days, there's been, you know, reporting about so-called clashes at the so-called border. Uh, and it creates the impression that there is this, um, you know, this separation of space wherein the Palestinians on, are on one side, the Israelis are on another, and if the Palestinians somehow cross or challenge that line, they've crossed some kind of border, uh, which is internationally recognized border, which is not the case. The Israelis are still effectively controlling the Gaza Strip. So it's not as if, you know, uh, the Israelis talk about this as securing their border from infiltrators. Uh, it's not as if these are, you know, people entering into an international, across an internationally recognized border from a foreign country. This is still Israeli-occupied territory, and Israel has obligations to the civilians there, um, and is restricting their freedom of movement. Um, so these are all important nuances that I think have to be kept uh, in, the, in the frame of the conversation. Okay, and, and a, one more little historical point. As for the fact that the – leaving aside the, 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 the occupation part, but as for why those borders are armistice lines um, – the original allotment of land by the UN was smaller than what we think of as Israel proper now, which is itself defined by that broader uh, set of lines that are armistice lines. And the reason for that is 
the original allotment led to conflict. Through the conflict, as you said, Israel expanded the territory it controlled beyond the original allotment to include Jerusalem, which wasn't part of the original package. And then that war, uh, that culminated in what is technically an armistice. So that there's some kind of technical difference between armistice lines and actually recognized borders. So there's that complication. Um, do you want to say something? And, and just yeah, just just for the purpose of of, of the the numbers of the 1947 partition plan, you know, during that time, the Jewish population was uh, close to about 30 percent of the total population of the territory, and the remainder was Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, and Christian. Uh, the allotment, though, was about 55 percent of the territory for what would become the Jewish state and 45% of the territory for what would then be the, the Arab state. And at the end of the war, uh, what had resulted was that the newly created state of Israel uh, had laid claim to 78% of the territory. So a significant increase from what was allotted to them under the partition plan. Okay, and, and one final thing about uh, the control Israel exerts, there is a blockade right an economic blockade it, it doesn't prohibit all exports and imports but but there is uh selectivity about what's allowed in and out of gaza it includes it isn't just along the what you would call the so-called border between gaza and israel but but the uh it's it's enforced in the ocean as well so of course if, if gaza were a nation that would i think be deemed an act of war to to put ships around a country and say you can't we get to control what comes in and out. So, so, so there is the blockade, and, and it is. Uh, I think it's. I think Israel has eased up somewhat on it, but it's. It is still not just a munitions blockade, right? I mean, certainly. Uh, I, I don't know no. what it, 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 it's. It's. It's broader than that. No, it's. It, it, it's certainly broader than that, and so. So it, 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 over the decades, the occupation has involved many different forms of limitation on freedom of movement. But after uh, 2005, uh, which is when Israel began to withdraw its presence on the ground in the Gaza Strip to exert control from the outside, uh, the, 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 the degree of restrictions uh, grew. And so uh, from 2005 until now, you've seen a very, very tight siege. Uh, it was tightened again in 2006 and 2007. And um, you almost have a, compared to where it was before that, uh, total restriction on uh, exports, a very, very limited number of imports. Uh, we learned from reporting that's been done by Israeli human rights organizations that uh, the uh, Israeli agencies that are responsible for uh, these kinds of matters actually calculated the precise caloric intake necessary to keep Palestinians uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, you know, able to sustain life and base the number of truckloads that would go into the Gaza Strip, um, you know, with humanitarian supplies on those calculations. And so the limitations on movement are designed to really keep life at a sustainable minimum. Uh, while at the same time absolutely obliterating the economy within the Strip, uh, keeping it uh, very, very dependent and incapable of being successful. Uh, and, um, you know, this has had a devastating impact on industries in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and several years ago, we saw uh, a collapse of industries in the Gaza Strip to the point now where you know the vast majority of people in the Gaza Strip are dependent on outside aid agencies for their daily sustenance. Okay. Um, so this was a, a calculated policy of, of de-development. Um, and you know people will point to the Gaza Strip and they'll say, you know, um, they had an opportunity to do something with it and make it great, but in reality. They never really had an opportunity because they were never allowed to function independently. And what does Israel say about why uh, the blockade goes so far beyond just keeping munitions out? I mean, I'm sure they don't describe it the way you did as a strategy of de-development. What, what is their line? 
Well, uh, Israeli officials have described it in a lot of different ways uh, over time. Uh, you know, one Israeli official described it as putting Gaza on a diet uh, in, in, uh, in the past. So, um, you know, they talk about the need to um, ensure security. But if this was just about security, it would be just about preventing, you know, weapons from getting in or whatever else. But it's not just about that. It's also about collapsing the economy. You know, if, if this was about preventing weapons from getting in, they would, uh, you know, allow shipments from Gaza to get out to the outside world to allow them to be able to function economically. But they deny the vast majority of exports as well. There are entire industries in the Gaza Strip that used to actually manufacture and produce a lot of agricultural things as well as flowers and, and, um, and fruit products and so on that would get exported outside of the Gaza Strip. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, these, these shipments have been uh, reduced to almost zero. Mm. And, uh, you know, you also have the fishing industry in the Gaza Strip because of this naval blockade, as you pointed out, there are restrictions on the extent to which Palestinian fishermen are able to go into the sea to, to fish. And under agreements that have been signed between the parties during the peace process, that limit was supposed to be at about 20 nautical miles. But over the course of the siege that we've seen since 2005, that has been limited at times to as little as three nautical miles, which has created an overfishing problem uh, for the Strip. And for the first time in its history, and we're talking about an area that has been you know, populated and for a very, very long time in history. For the first time in its history, most of the fish in Gaza in the period of the siege are being produced through uh, on-land uh, uh, farms, fishing mm -hmm. farms, because the fishing industry has been debilitated uh, by the naval blockade. So the, the, the policies are calculated to really uh, make the e economy flatline. Okay. So... um. So let's talk about this march. Now, uh, I gather it was initiated, the idea came from some social media activists or something. Eventually, Hamas kind of got on board. Hamas, of course, uh, I mean, Americans may think of it as been designated, I guess, by the U.S. government as a terrorist organization, right? But, but, in, but in Gaza, I mean, Hamas provides a lot of social services and so on, and so it's... it's uh, thought of differently there, but in any event, the name was the Great Return March, and I gather that is an allusion to the aspiration to return to homes in Israel, right? Was, was that the main uh, kind of thing on the agenda? Yeah, I think that was a big part of it. I think it was about a lot of different uh, things as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was about uh, uh, asserting the fact that, you know, uh, Palestinians in Gaza are not going anywhere. Uh, there is this, you know, uh, often talked about idea in right wing circles in Israel and, and, and as well in the United States that, you know, maybe we can just erase Gaza, push them off into Egypt, and then you don't have to even think about that problem out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the pressure that has been put on Palestinians in Gaza throughout the siege, you know, the, the, the message that Palestinians there are getting is that this really is calculated to make life unsustainable there to basically force them out uh, and to just erase them from, from uh, existence. And so it was in part, you know, talking about the right of refugees to return, but also a message, I think an important message that was sent to the Israelis that you can't ignore us. You can't pretend that we don't exist. You can't just push us off into Egypt or make us go away. We're here. We're not going anywhere. And we're going to make sure that you recognize that. So it was about defiance. It was about asserting their uh, presence. And what I think is also really important and maybe missed by, by many is, you, you know, you had talked about the role of Hamas in all of this. Yes, Hamas is a major player in Gaza. It is the de facto government there. If they didn't want this march to happen, I'm sure they would have prevented it from happening. Uh, but when I looked at the videos from the march, and when I looked at the images of the march, and there is a lot of video and images, I really scoured everything that I could find to find any sense 
of factional identification. Hmm. And you can't find any Hamas flags there. You can't find any Fatah flags there. The message that the organizers wanted to put out, and I think they put out very effectively, is that this is a Palestinian march. This isn't about Hamas or Fatah or any other faction. This is about the interests of the Palestinian people. And I think that's one of the reasons why they were able to successfully mobilize the number of people that they did and organize it in the way that they did. Okay, so now I, I, had, I, I had said, uh, you know, was was return the main thing on the agenda? I didn't mean by that. What was there a plan to actually march during during this protest to the homes? There, there wasn't. That said, uh, Israel. I think uh, to read a, I read a, a New York Times piece suggesting. Uh, that uh, the protest organizers had been vague about what exactly was going to happen with respect to the the so-called border fence, like were they going to try to breach it, were they going to try to reach it, were they whatever, and that I think the implication was that this had made it harder for Israel to respond without the use of force, their uncertainty about like what exactly was going to unfold uh, what what is your take on that? Was it fairly clear, like what what this was, you know, where the line was going to be drawn by the protesters and so on, or or what? Because the other thing is, I think Israel said in advance, if you get within a hundred yards of the fence or something like that, some distance, you do so at your own risk, kind of. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, the um, the Israelis have never really waited for input or engagement with the Palestinian side to determine how they're going to enforce. Uh, the situation on the ground in Gaza. Uh, for years, they have arbitrarily enforced what they call a buffer zone inside the Gaza Strip. So that if anyone approaches within a certain distance of the fence there, they open fire. People have been killed as far away as 15 to 1700 meters from the fence and as close as within 100 meters of the fence. So where exactly that line is can vary by the day. And on many occasions, including in recent weeks, Palestinian farmers have been killed in their farmland while they were just doing work there uh, by uh, Israeli snipers uh, on, on the Israeli side of the fence. So this is not something new. I think Palestinians knew that um, there was a real chance that, that the Israelis were going to open fire on them because that's something that they routinely do. Now, as far as, you know, um, whether or not them approaching the fence is some sort of justification for, for, for using the, the means that the Israelis did is another question altogether. Under international law, the use of lethal force is only supposed to be uh, an option that is chosen when there is an imminent threat to the life of the people doing the firing, right? So in this scenario, you have Israeli military snipers armed to the hilt, okay, behind a fence on top of sand dunes with armored personnel vehicles with very sophisticated intelligence apparatus aerial supremacy, and a mass of unarmed Palestinian protesters on the other side with maybe every once in a while someone who was throwing a rock, okay? Even if you grant that there may have been rock throwers here, and the majority of the pictures that we've seen all show masses of peaceful protesters throughout. Even if you grant rock throwing, there's no justification for the use of lethal force. But the soldiers were sent down there ahead of this march, 100 army snipers, as the Israeli media reported, with orders to shoot people who were approaching the fence. Whether or not they constituted any real threat or not was not part of what their orders were. It's very clear here that, that this was a firing squad is essentially what it was. Uh, and whenever they decided they wanted to, they chose to open fire which is why you saw, I think, the numbers that you did with, you know, hundreds of Palestinians who were injured by live ammunition and 17 people who were killed. Um, and I, I think as we've seen in statements from some members of the international community and human rights organizations, this is a flagrant violation of international law. 
So uh, now Israel said uh, that there was one case, and I guess this video is available, uh, that, that, that they have video of in one case there was a Palestinian who had a gun and was shooting it or something and was shot. But I have to say there's certainly plenty of video of the kind you describe where people uh, are shot who, who seem to pose no threat. I mean, a, a couple that I've seen, um, one was a person just kind of running away from the, you couldn't see the soldiers, but it's pretty clear running away from them. And uh, I don't know how close they'd gotten. Maybe they'd gotten close, but an unarmed person running away, shot, they fall. Uh, a more well-known one was this guy who I think died, who uh, he was carrying a tire. And we should say one thing I guess people are doing, you know, I mean, famously, you set tires on fire during protests sometimes. And I guess uh, in some cases, maybe they were setting them on tire and rolling them toward the fence or something. I don't know. But in any event, this was not a tire on fire, just a tire. You had one Palestinian running with the tire and you saw, uh, you know, gunfire hitting around his feet or something. He kind of goes down or falters. Uh, an, an ally of his, a Palestinian, runs up, grabs the tire from him, continues to run, presumably away from the Israelis, and he's the one who was shot and killed. And then there was one guy shot, wounded, I guess, while kneeling in prayer. And uh, his friend said previous to that he had been close to the fence, but whatever. So there's a lot of... Um, you, you know, there's a, a lot of video showing, I guess, what you say that that certainly by American standards, I mean, you know, if, if like a cop did this, it would be like open and shut. I mean, th th there's much tougher calls than this that lead to to uproars in America in terms of uh, police uh, using violence. Now, um, what uh, I mean, I, has Israel said anything about this? As you said, some human rights organizations have complained. Uh, the UN Security Council didn't do anything because the U.S. vetoed it. Nikki Haley uh, cast the vote for the veto, I gather, right? There was some uh, declaration that other, uh, that the rest of the Security Council was fine with. Is that the case? Yeah, the Security Council had uh, a meeting. They had an opportunity to, you know, each, you know, give, give their statement at the time. Um, but uh, a, a Security Council presidential statement was um, basically stymied by U.S. opposition. There wasn't a resolution that was brought before that would, you know, um, uh, allow for an opportunity for a veto I or see. a vote in general. But uh, and the process of a statement is something that needs to be supported by, you know, the, the, the different players, particularly the, the veto powers. And, you know, the, uh, the, the U.S. And, and, and its ambassador, Nikki Haley, put a stop uh, to that. And, you know, the message that this sends to Israel is that, yeah, go ahead, shoot unarmed protesters. You can do it on camera. That's fine. The United States is here to support you as you do that. Uh, and you asked about, you know, what the Israelis had said about this. The Israeli defense minister, which is, you know, in, in charge for the, the, the military there, commended the uh, soldiers for what uh, what they had done and for allowing, you know, Israelis to have a, a quiet holiday is, mm -hmm. is the way that he had, uh, he had put it. Um, so, you know, as far as uh, Israelis are concerned, the state, uh, you know, this is something that they fully authorize. Uh, and again, this is not new. You know, this is something that if, if you follow the situation near the fence, is actually quite regular. Um, what what we haven't seen is the scale of mobilization and organized protest on the Palestinian side that we saw here that created the um, uh, the circumstances uh, that uh, allowed for mass targeting by the Israeli uh, forces. But you know, earlier this year, I want to say it was in uh, maybe early January or late December, you know. Uh, the uh, Israelis at one point, you know, shot a man with no legs who was known for coming to the border area to hold up a Palestinian flag in protest. His name was Ibrahim Abu Thuraya, and he had lost his legs in previous wars uh, in uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, and he'd still come down to, to protest. And here's a double amputee who clearly poses no threat to the Israeli military, and he was shot in the head and killed. 
So, you know, if you follow these things uh, at, at the, the fence uh, in Gaza, the use of lethal force against unarmed civilians is the norm. Um, and, you know, what we saw on, fr on Friday was just that on a much larger scale. Okay. And, and by the way, how large... How large was the the protest? Uh, how many how many protesters were mobilized, roughly? You know what what I saw in terms of estimates was in the tens of thousands. Um, so I think uh, I saw a couple estimates between twenty and forty thousand. Um, it's of course really hard to tell. Uh, it's the largest mobilization uh, in that part of the Gaza Strip that I have ever seen uh, images of. Uh, it was organized in a number of different spots mm -hmm. uh, around cities uh, throughout the Strip that ranged from the northern part of the Strip down to the south along the, the fence. Uh, and so I think there were six different sort of uh, encampment spots. They had set up tents. And the ideas that were put out there by the organizers at the outset was that this was supposed to be a sustained demonstration that would start on the 30th of March, which is a uh, land day, a day that Palestinians commemorate uh, marking the uh, uh, killing of several Palestinian citizens of Israel who were protesting the confiscation of Palestinian land by the state in 1976. Uh, and so this was a day that this is a day that is annually marked. And so these events were supposed to start on land day but continue in a sustained fashion until May 15th, which is, of course, the day that Israel marks as its Independence Day. Palestinians mark it as a day that signifies the depopulation of Palestine in 1948 and is also, of course, this year, the day that the United States intends to open its embassy in Jerusalem uh, as well. And so this was supposed to be a sustained um, uh, event uh, not just across that space, but also over that period of time. Okay, and w and has what happened altered the prospects for making it a sustained demonstration? I mean, what does it look like is going to happen in the coming days and weeks? Well, uh, immediately after the massacre, there was a mourning period. Um, there are still the encampments are still there, as far as I can tell. There were lots of people who stayed uh, there. Um, and I imagine this is something that will continue. I think the organizers knew that, you know, this could happen, that the Israelis have been known to use lethal force and that, you know, with, with little to restrain them, that they may very well use lethal force uh, on a mass scale. But I think, you know, for Palestinians in Gaza, you know, they, they really see these kinds of tactics as a last resort for the situation that they're in. Um, you know, they, they, they see that the path of negotiations has really led nowhere. Uh, they see that the use of, um, you know, militancy and violence uh, is not a strategic option against a, a state that is as powerful uh, as Israel and has led to massive costs on the Palestinian side. Um, and uh, at the same time, the situation in the Gaza Strip is extremely desperate. The humanitarian conditions are very poor, the economic conditions are very poor, uh, and you have a situation now with uh, a lack of water, uh, you know, drinkable water, and a real scarcity of electricity that's making life very, very difficult in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and so I think, you know, for many people in Gaza, um, th they understand that there are major risks with protesting uh, against these Israeli policies, but nonetheless, are adamant about continuing to do so, um, because really, what are the alternatives? Yeah. Now, as for the uh, Israeli kind of logic behind what seems to have been, a, you know, a kind of thought out strategy of uh, shooting at people who did not pose any immediate threat to the troops. I mean, do you think the logic is like, well, if there's tens of thousands of aggrieved Palestinians on that side of the fence, what happens if they just start marching toward, what if they all just start crossing the fence and marching peacefully? Uh, you know, the demonstrations had been by and large peaceful. What if they, they approach the fence, it's in mass, 
start climbing over it. I mean, I guess it has what? It's chain link with barbed wire or something. Um, but, you know, it's something you could you could get over. And they just, what if they just keep on coming? Tens of thousands of people marching toward Israeli villages. What do we do then? Uh, I assume the thinking is something like, uh, send them a message early before that happens, right? I mean, is that your sense of what what the calculation is? Yeah, I actually think that the, the mobilization that took place, which again uh, was well-organized and overwhelmingly nonviolent, um, really unnerved the Israelis. Uh, not because there was a potential for violence, but rather precisely because it was nonviolent. And I think the Israelis are very well equipped and used to dealing with militant threats and violent threats. They know how to deal with it. They put a bullet in it and it's done. Uh, what they don't know how to deal with is uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. And I think they were terrified at the prospect of this tactic becoming widely embraced in a sustained fashion. And because of that, as you said, wanted to try to quash this thing early uh, and make it clear that any attempts at doing so would come at a massive cost and that they were not uh, messing around. Because, you know, what the Israelis are used to doing is sending the world this message that we have to defend ourselves. This is about security. And, you know, by and large, the international community is sympathetic to that message when it comes from Israel. But that narrative falls apart when what you're up against is nonviolent civil disobedience. And it becomes much more difficult for the Israelis to then defend the policies that they have when it looks like you're shooting on armed protesters, which is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Palestinians here, I think, have a tremendous opportunity. And this is really an Achilles heel for the Israelis because at the same time as they are ruling over millions of of Palestinians with brute force denying them the right to self-determination, they're simultaneously selling themselves to the world as some sort of liberal democracy, right? And the tactic of nonviolent civil disobedience actually exposes that for the sham that it is, because it puts those policies on trial without the distractions of, well, this is about security, this is about terrorism, this is about a threat to Israel and so on. It forces that confrontation. And it's because of that that the Israelis actually, well before this event, attempted to try to frame it as some sort of violent gathering. Mm -hmm. And if you saw in the days before the event, I actually heard much more about this event in the lead up to it from the Israelis than I did the Palestinian organizers who were behind it. The Israelis were putting out information. This is put on by Hamas. It's a cover for terrorist activity. It's, you know, they're going to be charging the fence. None of those things happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was put out there to lay the foundation for what they were preparing to do. And frankly, this is a lesson that they learned from uh, what was the flotilla massacre, if you recall, in 2010, where a number of uh, ships organized by uh, civilian protesters wanted to challenge the naval blockade of the Gaza Strip. And what ended up happening was that the Israelis intercepted the ships with their military. Naval commandos descended uh, on the, the ships of civilians. And ultimately, nine people ended up being killed. Nine civilians ended up being killed. Um, it started an international diplomatic incident with Turkey, uh, and which you know to this day has never really been uh, fully uh, healed. But one of the uh, interesting focuses of the investigative reports that the Israeli state did into the events that took place around the Flotilla uh, massacre was the conclusion that they came away with, which was the problem wasn't that we killed these unarmed protesters. The problem was we didn't do a good enough ex job explaining why we were going to do so beforehand. Uh, and so the, the, their conclusion was, we came to the PR battle late in the game, and so we can't do that anymore. We have to be prepared for these kind of things ahead of time. And when, when I started to see, uh, you know, all these Israeli official mouthpieces, you know, a week ahead of this march, put out all these messages about violence and so on that they anticipate, it became very clear that they were laying the groundwork for uh, a massacre.
So um, you, you alluded to the, from your point of view, the, the promise of nonviolent resistance, uh, and precisely because it puts uh, Israel in an awkward position, you know, it's become a cliche, I mean, for decades. You know, where is the Palestinian Mandela? You know, why, why isn't there uh, more of that? And, uh, you know, one thing I've asked, uh, and I may have asked you before, you know, but, but like, why not? And, and this this might uh, be a, a particularly salient uh, kind of tactic in the West Bank because it's clearer there that Israel is ruling the West Bank in a very hands-on way uh, and yet does not let Palestinians vote in Israeli elections. And so they're being ruled by a power that they have no no say in, in, in you know, in uh, kind of selecting. Um, and I've said, well, why don't you just... Uh, just say, look, we just want the vote, period. Uh, now, you hear two things. Um, one is th- that, uh, well, no, but to say you want to vote in an Israeli election is to, quote, normalize the occupation. It is to, uh, you know, it is to kind of uh, say, it is to grant a kind of legitimacy to the Israeli rule over the area, to say that we should vote in Israeli ele- and, so, and so on. You hear that. You also hear uh, sometimes people say, you don't understand how hard Israel has worked to sabotage incipient nonviolent movements. And I've never really understood, I've never gotten details on that. Let me, uh, I'm interested in your response to this, maybe both of those. But, but first, is it your sense that uh, there, there have, ha- has been the bubbling up of kind of... Uh, nonviolent resistance and that Israel has has done things to actually nip it in the bud? And if so, what are those things? Yeah, well, you know, first, in terms of the Palestinian Mandela, you're right that it's a, it's a cliche. I think what, what people often forget is that before, you know, Nelson Mandela was a apartheid with the apartheid South African government, um, you, you could find him in an apartheid prison for most of his adult life. And there are many, many Palestinians who are sitting in Israeli prisons right now, including, you know, political leaders uh, who, you know, could could one day play a role like that, perhaps. Um, but this idea that, you know, there's somewhere out there this missing, you know, uh, Palestinian leader and where where is he, I think, you know, um, really doesn't understand the ways in which state repression works. It's actually quite sophisticated, of course, not just in Israel, but but everywhere. Uh, and um, you have had, uh, throughout Palestinian history, many, many different organized nonviolent efforts. In fact, I would say that the majority of nonviolent uh, Palestinian resistance uh, to Zionism, even predating the state of Israel, has been in nonviolent forms. The kind, of course, that we hear the most about is the violent resistance because, you know, that leads to the most headlines, that leads to the most uh, death toll. And, of course, part um, of this depends on how you, <clears throat> excuse me, how you define violence. I mean, Israel would say if you're throwing rocks, that's violence. You may not be including, you know, throwing rocks at, at well-armed soldiers on the other side of a, of a checkpoint as uh, violence, right? But, but uh, there is that question. Yeah, I think it, it, it's also important to think about the modalities of state violence as well, right? When you have restrictions on movement that are imposed on people uh, at, at the barrel of a gun, that very much is violence as well, even if you don't pull the trigger, right? Uh, it is the use of violence to create certain systems of checks and balances that hold people outside of their natural condition of freedom. Right. So it's it's systemic in a way that we often don't talk about and interact with resistance as well. Um, so it, that has a lot to do with what shapes and forms resistance. OK. The case that we saw here in Gaza, you had you know masses of, of people who were overwhelmingly nonviolent. Uh, and the response from the Israeli state was to deploy their army snipers. You know, so um, the, the the message to Palestinians about where the Israeli intentions are, are very clear here. They're they, they're intending to take this in a direction of violence. Uh, and so, you know, whenever we talk, talk about sort of repression and and dissent, uh, 
the violence goes in both directions uh, off, of, off of each other. And oftentimes it's state repression that can lead to violence more than the actions of the dissenters. And that's, of course, something that's true everywhere, not just in, in uh, Israel and Palestine. OK, um, so uh, where do you well, where do you see this going, first of all? And then I'll ask you a larger kind of question about where things are going. But uh, you, you think that that. Uh, this particular protest will continue in visible form. And do you, do you anticipate more people dying uh, or what do you see? I imagine that this will continue. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure for how long it will go on, but I think that the, you know, the organizers have made clear that this is something that they want to continue through the 15th of May. Um, I, uh, I think they were well aware that, you know, this was a possibility, even a likelihood. Um, uh, but, you know, I think I think there are great risks to simply walking away uh, at this point, because there was a great deal of hope that was created on the ground. You know, you when you saw the masses of Palestinians who were gathering under a Palestinian flag, not under a factional banner. Uh, which is something, you know, that has plagued the Palestinian national movement for over a decade now, this factional division. When you saw people gathering in that way, asserting their rights and doing so nonviolently, you know, that's something that Palestinians of all, of all backgrounds can really gather around. And to abandon that at, at this point, I think would be really demoralizing. And I don't think that would be good for Palestinians and I don't think it would be good for Israelis either. Look, the international community has for years sent a message to the Palestinians. Abandoned violence, abandoned violence, abandoned violence. We need to send Palestinians a message, very importantly, from the international community now that if you choose nonviolence, we will support you. Because if you send them the message that they must abandon violence and also send them the message that they must abandon nonviolence, the message that we're really sending them is that no resistance to oppression whatsoever is acceptable. And that is a recipe for catastrophe and ultimately a descent once again into violence, because that's where this will ultimately go. Palestinians are not going to accept living under conditions of oppression forever. There has to be a, a, a way to resist this, and the international community here plays a very big role. So I think it's important that these protests continue and be supported, not just for this particular moment in time, but because of the impact that it has on Palestinian strategy moving forward. It can be quite significant. Okay. And, you know, in terms of uh, assuming this does go on and assume kind of comparable form in the coming days or weeks and and Israel again feels threatened by it and uh, is tempted to, to shoot people in response, um, how... Has the publicity played out so far from your point of view uh, in, in terms of how easy or hard it is for Israel to keep doing this as a political matter? So, for example, I described uh, this video that circulated a lot on the Internet uh, of this guy carrying a tire, running away from Israeli uh, troops. He shot and killed. Um, has that been on CNN? Has that been on the, 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 the CBS, NBC News? Uh, you know, like what? Uh, what is the what is the the media the media coverage of this looking looking like in those kinds of pragmatic terms to you? So I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, coverage of it on on mainstream television news. Um, there has been you know a good bit of, of coverage of it uh, online and sort of the mainstream you know media outlets their their, their websites and uh, and so on. Um, and, you know, the, the, the content is there to be reported on. As you said, the videos are numerous. And I spent a good part of Friday covering that via Twitter and, and tweeting it out for, for people to see. Um, you know, the, the Israeli line on this is, you know, um, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward uh, all, all the time. Um, you know, if there are videos as of, like the one that you referenced of a, a protester being shot in the back, and one of the things they'll say is, well, you know, the, the video doesn't really show you the whole story or they'll say that the video is fabricated or they'll say that, you know, uh, Palestinians made the whole thing up. 
the, you know, there's there is a there is a, a long list of Israeli e excuses that are trotted out every time that there is incriminating video, uh, and there is a, a history uh, of that. Um, there was a time where um, you know uh, Israeli soldiers were caught shooting two unarmed Palestinian children, 15 year olds, and you know the the video actually uh, was captured by a CNN camera, and so it made it to CNN. Uh, and at the time, uh, the former Israeli ambassador, Michael Oren, uh, was uh, a contributor, a CNN contributor, after his stint as ambassador. Uh, and in the segment that covered this, uh, where Wolf Blitzer was hosting, he said, look, you know, you have two boys that were killed here. Uh, and the ambassador said, look, we don't even know if they're really dead, okay? Uh, and, and we don't know if this video is real. And of course, you know, these, these, these boys have been shot and killed and buried. And there was, you know, a lengthy coverage of their funeral processions with hundreds of people, you know, attending the, the, them as well. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the it, it, Israelis will try to explain away even the unexplainable. Uh, and, and that's why I think it's so important that this kind of this kind of demonstration, this kind of resistance continues because it puts the Israelis in a very difficult position of having to justify why they're doing these things. And I think, you know, when when their justifications, their attempts at justification are out there and the videos are out there, people will make up their minds and they won't make them up in a way that's favorable to Israel. OK. Now, of course, another thing Israel would say is, uh, <clears throat> well, you have to understand, and again, I know, I, I take your point, this was not a Hamas operation in the way some things have been Hamas operations, but in general, a part of their get tough on Gaza policy has been couched in terms of Hamas and the fact that its official position is to not accept the legitimacy of, you know, a Zionist state or whatever, and so the, Israel would say, well, look, Hamas is itself an existential threat. Um, they, they, they have, uh, you know, they've never said that they could, uh, live with A, B or C. It's all or nothing. Uh, and so w w what do you say to, what do you say to that? I mean, they, they can say whatever they want about Hamas, you know, I mean, it's, it's really irrelevant to the fact that these are unarmed protesters that they're shooting at with, with live ammunition. It's really, it's, it's completely irrelevant, you know, um, it's, it's just not the way that the law works. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I understand that they have their disagreements with Hamas. Hamas obviously feels very differently about the Israelis, too. But that doesn't give Hamas the right to, you know, shoot at any unarmed Israeli just because the Israelis don't like Palestinians. That's, that's not how this works, right? Um, the Israelis have obligations under international law. And as far as it relates to you know, dealing with um, unarmed protesters or anyone who doesn't present an imminent threat to life, you're not supposed to use live ammunition. They went down there with the intent to use live ammunition as policy to deal with these protesters. I think that's the, the big issue here. And whether, you know, Hamas exists in Gaza or the protesters are members of Hamas or not, if, if they're not posing a threat, you're not supposed to shoot and kill them. It's as simple as that. Okay, so last kind of subject. I alluded to this. I, I asked you, how do you see this playing out in the short term in terms of this uh, series of protests in, in, in Gaza? But um, to step back and look at the bigger picture and ask, like, where is this whole thing going? You know, for some years, it has seemed to me like it was basically too late for a two-state a solution in in part because if you look at the Israeli settlements and the whole infrastructure built to support them, I mean, there's more and more you know people who have a stake in not withdrawing any settlements, and that just gets harder and harder uh, politically from Israel's point of view for for a lot of reasons. It, it has just seemed like uh, that's not realistic, and and if you if you take and, and and I'm far from alone in this assessment. More and more people have been saying this. Um, if you take that off the table, you know, it's like, well, you know, uh, the, uh, if you're talking about a one state solution, I guess you mean either uh, the, the, the entry of Palestinians into the Israeli political system, which is, as Israelis will point out, would probably mean that, that before long Jews were a minority 
in Israel. They're not, so they don't find that attractive. Uh, another form of the one state solution, I guess. Well, it's either explicit apartheid. That's one kind of one state solution or a kind of ethnic cleansing that sends an appreciable number of Palestinians into Jordan or something. I mean, I just don't, I don't see like a good, uh, a particularly good outcome down the road. You know, when you try to get optimistic about what could evolve here, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't think any plausible outcome is really ideal for either people. Um, I think that there, there ultimately will be an agreement, a political accommodation, um, and there's going to have to be sacrifices uh, on all sides. That's just the way that, that, that it's going to have to work out. What those sacrifices are are the question. Um, you know, the, the proposal that has been out there for the, the better part of the last 30 years has been this idea of uh, land for peace uh, and the, the principle of a, of, of a two-state solution. Uh, if if that doesn't if that doesn't work, and it's very clear, I think at this point that that's not going to work. Um, then what what changes is is not that you don't continue working for peace, but you have to find a different formula. And I think the trade-off uh, can no longer be land for peace for one of the, the reasons that you mentioned. The demographics are too intertwined at this point for there to be a, a, a realistic sort of separation. Um, uh, and the Israelis have no real interest in, in doing so. Um, the, the trade-off at this point is uh, about rights for peace uh, and about the uh, inclusion of Palestinians into a, uh, a singular system. Um, obviously, if that's the case, there are going to have to be sacrifices that the Israelis are going to have to make as well. Um, but, you know, uh, the alternative of apartheid, which is the situation that we have today in the absence of some kind of accommodation, maybe that's the most attractive status quo for Israelis today. Uh, but over time, that's only going to get more costly because what we saw on the ground in Gaza once the two-state paradigm is fully collapsed and this idea of negotiations for a Palestinian state are, are, are firmly part of history, what we saw on the ground in Gaza is going to become the norm, where you have routine confrontations between unarmed protesters and the Israeli state, um, uh, uh, you know, attempting to impose its will uh, by brute force to keep these people subjugated. That's, that's not something that's going to be able to sustain itself in the 21st century for a very long time. I don't think so. Th that's what the Israelis are facing. Ultimately, the decision lies with them, and it lies with people in the international community who are invested in this system uh, who have to also confront the choice of whether or not they find it acceptable. I don't think they, they should, and I don't think they will over the long time. And do you think, like, the pressure you imagine, I guess, building that would make it impossible for Israel to sustain the status quo, quo um, is that highly dependent on pressure from Amer the American government and, the, and or the American people? Because not a lot of that seems to be coming these days or really ever. I, I mean, I mean, you know, you've seen a, you've seen more sympathy to the Palestinian cause in Europe it is is. Uh, so is like pressure from Western Europe as a political matter, is that enough? Or are you ultimately going to have to kind of flip an, a, an American administration uh, on this issue? And, you know, you saw with Obama, who I think was in his heart somewhat sympathetic. Uh, but you saw how even he uh, finds the political pressure pretty formidable, right? I mean, I mean, he, he had to wait until uh, he was a... a a lame duck, basically, to do something pretty forceful at the UN, which was not veto uh, a kind of uh, a resolution that Israel perceived as as hostile. So I guess I guess do do you the question is just um, do you do you see Amer strong American support for the Palestinian cause to be essential to resolving this, um, and if so, do you do you think that's realistic? I, I do think America plays a key role, the key role. Uh, I do think you will see, you know, some changes in Europe over time. But even with Europe, real sea change in Europe on this issue will not come before America gives it license to do so. They will follow America's lead ultimately, as they do on most things when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, I do think that U.S. support for Israel in a good part 
is dependent on this idea that there is an Israeli-Palestinian solution on the horizon, right? Which is one of the reasons why the peace process is so instrumental, because there is a conflict between American values, right? The values that America claims to uphold, this idea of liberty and democracy and freedom and equal rights and all of these wonderful things, uh, and the way that Israel is treating the Palestinians. And so for the United States to continue supporting Israel, there has to be at least this promise that there is a solution on the horizon, down the line, within reach, okay, uh, uh, in our imaginations. If that disappears, and I believe it's been disappearing, and people are forced to choose between supporting Israel as an apartheid state or not supporting Israel as, a, as an apartheid state, I think that changes the equation a lot. And I think over time, even the United States can change. I do think there are segments of the United States that probably will never change because their attachment to Israel is not really about the values that motivate many other people, the freedom and the democracy and the civil rights and all of that, but because of other ideological connections that, you know, are, are, not, uh, are not contingent on those things. But I don't think that's the majority of Americans, and I don't think you need uh, all of those people on board to see the kind of shift in the United States necessary to create pressure that would allow for an Israeli wake-up call. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is around the corner, but I do think it's an imaginable uh, in the future, especially given the direction that uh, Israel is taking the situation on the ground. So you think the sooner people realize that the two-state solution is dead, 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 the better? Yeah, I, I, I think that's the case. I mean, look, right now, the only people that are still talking about a two-state solution are the Palestinians, are the Palestinian Authority. The Israelis are not talking about it. The Americans, since the Trump administration, don't utter the words two-state solution. Um, you know, the Europeans are still talking about it, but that's because... You know, they, they don't know what's going on in Washington under this administration. They are hoping the day will come where they can hit the reset button uh, and things go back to, to where they were. Um, but, you know, the Israelis right now, the other day, they announced that, you know, they're planning a major infrastructure project uh, to build a railway system to settlements deep inside the West Bank uh, that would cost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Uh, and are projected to be concluded, you know, in about 10 years. This is not a state that has any plans of, of leaving, right? They're making long-term plans to sink hundreds of millions of dollars of costs, not next to the Green Line, but deep inside the West Bank, right? Their, their intentions are very clear. I think the sooner that people realize that that's the case, the sooner they have to confront Israel with making a choice. Either you're going to be a democracy or you're going to be an apartheid state, if you're going to be in an apartheid state, and yes, this is an apartheid state, what we have today, then we, we simply cannot accept that. We're going to change our policy towards you. The sooner that confrontation comes, the better. Okay, well, thank you uh, for taking the time, Yusuf. So where can people find you on Twitter? What's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's Yusuf Munayr, um, at, at Yusuf Munayr, okay. I guess, Y-U-S-E-F-M-U-N-A-Y-Y-E-R. And we will link to that on the site. And then uh, what about the uh, U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights? I guess they have a Twitter feed and a website and stuff. Yes. Uh, our website is, is uscpr.org, U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, the acronym, .org. Um, and you can find great um, you know, information there about how to get involved in ways to actually uh, challenge this situation. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I suspect we'll have occasion to check in with you again if you have time, because I don't think the situation's going to get resolved tomorrow. Take care. Thank you, Bob.